Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor here, and I am uniquely excited because we have a guest who I think brings the the nuance and and the the insight that is really important for a very very specific issue. And and she is an author, an activist, and a small farmer. And and her her most noteworthy work, at least for this audience, is the vegetarian myth. And uh, we have none other than Lear Keith with us. Lear, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Jonathan. Well, thank you for being here. And Lear, I, two things I want to do right from the start is I want to dig into your story. But the the thing that most drove me to to want to get you on the show and and to share your work was that your message. I want to I want to I want to set maybe some listeners' minds at ease. This is not going to be a show about ba- bashing vegetarianism or saying that. Uh, you should all eat meat all the time, always. But Lear, what really strikes me about your work and, and the message that I think you hit on so well, and that I struggle with in, in a different sense, is this impression that some people have that eating plants is good and eating animals is bad. And it's really that simple. And if you just eat plants, you're a good person. And <laughs> if you just eat animals, you're a bad person. And and obviously it's not that simple, right? Yeah. Um, I, well, I was a vegan for 20 years, so I have been as far into that world as anyone can be. So I understand the mindset and I understand, I understand the arguments. And I always like to start by saying that you know, the underlying values of that vegetarian ethic are not at issue. Mm-hmm. So justice and sustainability and compassion and anything that questions human hubris and human entitlement. And those are really the only values that are going to get us to the world that we need. So it's not the values that are, are the problem. It's really information. And it's a really, it's a vast cultural ignorance about the nature of nature as opposed to the nature of agriculture. So where do those plant foods come from? And what is the damage they leave behind? Um, and I, so I think a lot of people are attracted to that vegetarian ethic because it seems very simple. If there's a dead animal on your plate, well, something suffered and died for you. Whereas if it's just plants, then nothing was hurt. And therefore it seems more compassionate. And I mean, I believed that for 20 years. So I understand, you know, what it's like to, to believe that. But the, the truth is a lot more complicated. Um, so, I mean, on, I think there's three basic reasons people become vegetarian. And one is, you know, that that sense of, of moral moral rightness that, you know, I don't want to hurt anything. I want my life to be as compassionate as possible. Um, the next one would be politically. That there's this idea that if we all only eat plants, there would be enough food um, for everyone. And then the third reason is the health, the health issue that many people believe that eating a high carb, low fat diet is the way to produce you know, the longest life, the most robust health and all that. As it turned out, none of those things are true. But if you don't have more information, they seem on the surface as if they might be true because we hear them you know, from every angle. And certainly when I was 16 and I took up being a vegan, I didn't have any other information to compare it with. So it seemed like the best thing to do. Well, and, and Lear, I want to dig into more detail of, of your story and your evolution, for lack of better terms, and then, and then where, you, where you think we should focus our efforts to best serve those three goals you so uh, succinctly and wonderfully outlined. But I, I, before we do that, I want to I get your take and I'm going to be a little selfish here because I want your insights on something that I struggle personally with. And that's the, the seemingly um, human characteristic of demanding black and white or having an attraction to the black and white. Let me give you an example of how this works in, in, in my little corner of the world. Hey, Jonathan, is fat good or bad? Hey, Jonathan, is protein good or bad? Hey, Jonathan, are carbs good or bad? <laughs> the answer is there are good carbs and bad carbs. There are, <laughs> and there's good fats and bad fats. And it seems like there's good ways to eat plants and bad ways to eat plants and good ways to eat animals and bad ways to eat animals. Would that be a fair characterization? Yes. And I think there's two things going on. One is that that's a developmental stage that people go through when they're young. And really, we're supposed to grow out of it. We're supposed to become adults who can actually hold many different ideas at once and try to figure out, you know, the actual truth of, of the world that we live in. And, you know, we have to make moral decisions. We have to make political decisions, but you need lots and lots of information. And eventually that information is supposed to become knowledge. And by the time you're really old, you're actually supposed to have wisdom, but that's a (laughs) long process. And it starts as a young child with that kind of black and white thinking. 
And that's a, you know, it's a good thing when you're 10 or 11, right? Because you need to know what the rules are. If you step out into the street, you're going to get hit by a car. That's pretty black and white. And so, of course, children cling to those kinds of rules because they need to know how to survive. But then you become an adolescent and you learn to question all those rules and you go in the opposite direction. But it's still just another kind of black and white thinking because now it's all knee jerk. Well, then you hit 21, 22, 23. Your brain is supposed to be finished, right? You're supposed to have finally an adult mature brain. Everything's supposed to be wired in together to your frontal lobes. You're supposed to have some you know, ability to moderate your emotions. And at that point, you really need to start to learn to think so that you can absorb that information, turn it into knowledge. But that's a long process. And I think a lot of us stumble along as best we can. And it's not the easiest thing to do. You know, I mean, so I get the black and white thinking. Um, and then the other problem is that I think people are so overloaded, you know, especially with the economy being so hard uh, it's especially if you have children, you know, when do you have time to sit and read book after book, scientific paper after scientific paper, trying to figure out what is the best thing to eat? Why is that the best thing to eat? What's going to help my kids the most? I don't know anybody who has that kind of time. So, you know, you end up falling back on whatever the culture is telling you at the moment. And a lot of that information is just completely wrong. So in order to get to better information, it takes a huge time commitment. And I think most people just don't have it right now. So we're in this kind of a bind. And that's why it's so important to have shows like yours where you're sort of condensing the information so people, you know, can at least get some concept of, you know, what you're talking about, what might be a better way, uh, rather than having to do all that primary research on their own. Well, well, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I, I certainly appreciate your, your kind words there. And it is this this overstressed, overtaxed over everything society where, where we just we run out of space in our minds and we run out of attention. And, and, and that certainly makes a lot of sense. Well, well Lier, let's let's talk about the, the noble motives, which are certainly there's no question of the nobility of these motives that often uh, in, in, in prompt individuals to become a vegetarian or a vegan. And let's talk about how those are or are not actually accomplished by just globally giving up just like simply, quote unquote, giving up animals and focusing on plants. And let's also include if the goal is to minimize suffering, how that may or may not actually minimize suffering as it relates to your own personal health. Okay. So it's a way bigger question than, you know, what's dead on my plate. The question really is what died to get this food onto my plate. So you may not see the death directly, but it's there. We have to understand what agriculture is. We live in an agricultural society. We have for 10,000 years, and that makes it really hard to question agriculture it's like questioning air or questioning God, you know, it like surrounds us everywhere. And it doesn't even occur to us that this is a, an activity that humans took up at a certain point in time. Not everybody took it up. It only actually arose in seven different places around the globe. At this point, it's conquered the world. But what is it? Well, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it. And I mean down to the bacteria. And then you plant it to human use. So it's, it's biotic cleansing. You're taking an entire community of plants, of animals, of microfauna, and you're just destroying them. You're giving them nowhere to live. So it's mass extinction on a global scale. And right now, 200 species are going extinct every single day, mostly because of this activity, ultimately, called agriculture. So that's what agriculture is. There's no way that you can look at an activity that has destroyed 98% of the old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies and call that friendly to animals because it's mass extinction. Then that's not agriculture on a bad day. That's what it is. You have to clear the land to plant those annual monocrops. It's the only way you can do it. And, you know, look out the window, right? Whatever you see, your backyard, your front yard, there's probably grass on the, on the lawn. And if you're going to plant a garden, what do you have to do? You've got to dig up the grass. You've got to destroy what's there. Then you can plant those annual crops, whatever it's lettuce or broccoli, or if you're going to, you know, corn, whatever you're going to grow, the land has to be cleared. We all know this on some level, but because most of us aren't actually engaged in farming, um, we don't really have any idea where our food comes from or how destructive this is. But, you know, to quote Jared Diamond, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Guns, Jones and Steel, he said agriculture is the biggest mistake the human race ever made. Now, he says that precisely because it's this inherently destructive activity. The moment you start doing it, you are drawing down, you are taking away all those species, the water, the soil, everything starts being destroyed in that region. Um, but the population starts to grow at this exponential level. So we've made ourselves dependent on an activity that is literally killing the planet. And that's the problem. I didn't know that at age 16 when I thought that being a vegan 
was this wonderful, compassionate, you know, nonviolent way to live. All I knew was that on my plate, there was no dead animal. So it seemed like the right thing to do. But having that bigger perspective, you end up making very different choices. So that's the moral issue. You know, is there something dead here? And, and if you're eating agricultural foods, it's the entire world that's been killed for this. All right. Now you've got the political issue. And so here's this idea that, you know, if we all stopped eating animal products, there would be enough grain to feed everybody. A couple of problems with this. Um, we sort of got the cart before the horse on this one. We've had this one backwards for maybe 30 years. And this really goes back to Frances Moore LePay and Diet for a Small Planet. And she did a wonderful thing trying to get people to think about food in a political way. And that's all to the good. And clearly, you know, she has wonderful values as a person. I'm, I'm, this is not in any way, you know, to, to insult her or trash her. You know, I think she, she does really good work in the world. But she got this part wrong. Um, you have to understand the political economy of essentially, you know, the global economy and, and how it works. The, the grain production is not driven by um, the needs of animal agriculture. They get what's left over. The problem is that there's so much left over. So in 1950, the world was essentially out of topsoil. Agriculture had pretty much run its course around the globe, and the major grain-growing regions were played out. There was just no soil left. There was nothing left. And what happened then was this, you know, this thing called the Green Revolution, where scientists figured out how to take oil and gas and turn it into usable nitrogen for plants. And then the plant breeders got involved and learned to breed plants that were much smaller, but would produce much larger seed heads. Now they've pushed these plant genomes as far as they can go. There, there aren't going to be any more breakthroughs on that level. I mean, the plants are as short as they can get, and they've got these absolutely gigantic seeds and we're sort of done, you know, like wheat and rice cannot get any bigger. Um, but it all depends on that oil and that gas, that cheap fossil fuel to create the fertilizer. So 1950, this whole thing kicks off. There is immediately this huge glut of corn. And there's a mountain of corn being produced, particularly in, in the Midwest here in the United States. It had nowhere else to go. And so from that moment, um, it becomes clear in a capitalist economy that if you buy that corn really cheap and you take animals out of their native habitat, and put them into essentially cities, you know, they're living on concrete inside steel buildings. So you take them off the farm, you put them in cities, and then you feed them all this corn, well, you can grow meat really cheap because they will get fat really fast. I mean, when they eat a lot of corn, it's the same as when we eat a lot of corn. <laughs> it's really fat, right? And that's what happens. So instead of it taking a year and a half to produce a beef cow, you can get it in nine months. And that's why. It's because you're feeding them the wrong food. Um, the food will kill them. I mean, the, the corn is way too acid for their stomachs. It burns holes in their stomachs. Um, almost all the beef cows that go to slaughter at this point have, you know, they got blood poisoning, they got liver poisoning, they got all these problems from eating that corn. It's not their native diet. But by giving them that corn for the last two or three months of their lives, yes, they will grow at an exponential rate. So all of this is about the fact that there's this mountain of corn that had nowhere to go, and it made sense economically, not certainly not morally, certainly not politically, but economically it made sense to feed it to those cows. That's where factory farming came from. Okay, It is not the native diet of a cow to eat corn. They're supposed to eat grass, which is totally different. Um, so right away, you know, it's got nothing to do with the demands of the cows. It has to do with the demands of this sort of market capitalist economy where fossil fuel underlies the whole thing. And now the other side of this is, well, what about all the poor people in India or whatever who should be eating that grain? It's kind of a crazy model because why is it that people in, you know, pick your country, India, um, can't provide their own food? And the reason is because there's six corporations that essentially control the world food supply. And it's just like when Walmart comes to town um, and they'll, you know, offer way cheaper stuff than your local hardware store can, can ever do. And they drive all the local businesses out, out of business. And now all you have is Walmart and they've got this giant monopoly and all of your neighbors no longer have jobs because Walmart put them out. And now everybody has to shop at Walmart. And then what do you know? The prices go back up. Well, it's the exact same model. You've got these six corporations that go to places like the Philippines, India, Taiwan, pick your country, and they do what's called agricultural dumping. So they can offer food at about half the price that, that the local farmers can produce it for. So they undercut the economy entirely, and they have driven literally millions of people off their land and into urban squalor. And the reason that the food is so cheap that they bring in, and two reasons, one is, of course, that Green Revolution stuff. But the other problem, of course, is that they get massive subsidies from the U.S. government. So ultimately, it's the U.S. taxpayers that are paying for this. Okay, it's called the Farm Bill every year. And what it is, is it's just income shifting from all of us to these six giant corporations. They get billions of dollars every year. 
And because now they can produce it so cheaply, they can go to these poor countries, completely destroy the local economies, and now everybody's dependent on those six corporations to buy their food. This is not called justice. I mean, there's just no way you can look at this and think this is a model that we should be using. But every time you say, oh, people in India should be dependent on the, you know, the Midwest for their food, that's the model you're suggesting, which doesn't actually make any sense. People know how to feed themselves. They know how to feed their local communities. They need to be left alone to do it. So setting up a dependent model where they have to either sell off their local resources, so things like trees, metal, fish, whatever they've got, or sell their labor really cheap, working in sweatshops, essentially, um, then they have to get the cash, then they can buy the food from the U.S. corporations. I just can't see this as a model that involves any kind of justice anywhere. Um, but oddly, this is the model that people seem to be suggesting. And they really need to think it through a little bit better. Because I think if they did, they would see that this is not actually the world that they want, where people all around the world are dependent on these six corporations and can't support themselves anymore. So that's the problem with this, you know, everybody could be fed if. Um, they've really got the cart before the horse on that one. So that's the political... Go ahead. You're going to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I think that the, the way you described it at the very end, like that that's not justice. And when we take a step back and see what that's doing to the system itself is is a great way to characterize that. And ironically, you could use that, maybe not ironically, interestingly, you could use that same descriptor for how this works on a smaller scale with an individual's biology, where we, we, we on the surface, there's this approach, plants heal you, animals kill you. And, 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 but when we take a step back and we look at that systemically, and we look at that's actually doing justice to your health and well-being, that may not be the case either, right? Right. And that's the third reason that people often take up that, you know, plant-based diet is that we've been told now for almost 30 years that if we eat a high carb, low fat diet, that everything will be fine and that all animal products are the work of the devil and you should never touch them. So I did that for 20 years and my health failed catastrophically. Um, I was not a junk food vegan. I mean, I wouldn't even eat ketchup if there was sugar in it. I never ate white sugar. I never ate white flour. I only ate, you know, the whole grains and the beans and you know, all that stuff. And it just completely failed. Um, and there, I'm 48 years old. There's a whole generation of us now who have already been through this. We tried it. We believed in it. We couldn't understand why it wasn't working. Um, you know, I wanted God to be a just God. It seemed like it should work. It didn't work. Um, and in my friendship circle, I was pretty much the last holdout. I tried and tried and tried, and it just kept failing. And most of my friends had already given up on it. Um, and then the day came when I had to just say, I, I'm going to die if I keep doing this. And I had to give it up. So then was the long search. Why didn't this work? Where did it all go wrong? It seemed to make so much sense. So then you start investigating the sort of alternate view, you know, where you, you have to start doing research. So what is actually wrong with animal products? Why were we told that these were so terrible to eat? And, you know, it turns out that there's a lot of political clout behind these decisions that the government makes. There's a lot of money, a lot of moneyed interests. Um, one thing to note is that the U.S. Department of Agriculture, you know, who came up with that wonderful food pyramid where you're supposed to be eating, I don't know, 50 servings of grain a day or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, their job, they are not charged with promoting human health. That's not their job. Their job is actually to sell commodity agricultural foods. And that's what that pyramid does. It tells everybody to eat wheat and corn and soy and so they're doing their job, but their job was never to protect our health. Their job was to sell stuff that corporate America produced. So right away, we've got a problem. Um, so that's the USDA part of it. And then there's other branches of the government that have also come up with, you know, that kind of high, high carb, low fat sort of, you know, proposal for us. And, you know, it turns out that that was all very politicized as well. The best book on this, honestly, is Gary Taub's book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And he's got a whole chapter where he walks people through um, exactly what happened with the McGovern Commission and why they put forward this proposal. And the thing that's most interesting to me was that there were many, many doctors who came forward and said, you can't do this kind of experiment on the American public. It will end in disaster. We know that animal foods are protective. These are the foods people have eaten since the beginning of time, essentially. And to tell them to change, I mean, we already have enough evidence that you know corn oil and whatever vegetable oils do tremendous damage to people's arteries and hearts. And this is a, such a bad idea. You really can't do this. And they actually had to have eight more weeks of hearings because so many doctors came forward and said, please don't do this to the American public. 
and they didn't they didn't win the day. So down it went. And instead, we've been now for a whole generation eating this other model. And American health has just collapsed as far as I can tell. I mean, you've got diabetes now in 10-year-old children. That was never seen before. You know, the autoimmune diseases are way up. You've got all the autism, all these things that ultimately have a very strong dietary component. Um, so anyway, I had to do a lot of research on my own to figure out why had this diet failed me. And indeed, I, I found answers. But for, in my case, it's too late. Some of this stuff is not reversible. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm so impassioned about this is that I really want to stop the next generation of you know, engaged, thoughtful young people from taking this up before it's too late, because it's going to end for them in the kind of disaster that it's been for me. And Lier, what, what, so what was your dietary evolution? Obviously, you still, I would imagine, you still hold the, the, the morals and the values and the inspiration that led you down the vegetarian or vegan path to begin with. Uh, but, but you're obviously not a vegetarian or a vegan now. So what, how have you changed your life to support those values while not taking this traditional vegetarian or vegan route? So there were a couple of things that came together for me. One was in finding out the nutritional information that I needed, that we really do need animal products, particularly animal fats. There are some vitamins, essential vitamins, that you simply cannot get from plants. And that includes vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and in many cases, vitamin K2. You just can't get them from plant substances. They don't exist. Anim animals need them and plants don't. So there's no reason for plants to produce them. So right away, there's a problem. Um, then there's all the wonderful things that animal fats will do for you beyond those vitamins. And, you know, cholesterol is actually the, the basic uh, sort of building block of all your cells. And without it, you know, without cholesterol, you'd just be a puddle on the floor. I mean, it gives every cell structural stability. Your brain is almost 80% fat. So if you're not eating fat, um, your brain just isn't going to function. We are actually a set of electrical impulses inside a watery environment. That's our nervous system inside our bodies. And just like an electric cord that you might run outside in the pouring rain, if it's not, if it doesn't have insulation on it, you know, it's not going to work. It'll short out. And it's the same thing. And what coats every nerve in your body is actually saturated fat. Um, so if you're not eating any cholesterol, your nerves just aren't going to work. So you're going to get depression. You're going to get anxiety. Um, you know, you might end up with something like MS where that is just eroding. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that, that saturated fat is just absolutely necessary. Your, your lungs, the very, very top surface level, the surfactant on your lungs, that very last layer that actually does the air exchange is built from saturated fat. Um, your intestines need a tremendous amount of it. There's a 48 hour turnover for every one of the cells that line your intestines without cholesterol. You can't do it. And there's just no way to build that many cells. So on down the line, um, all of your hormones are made from cholesterol. That's like the mother hormone. And if you don't have any, you can't make hormones. That includes all your sex hormones. So testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. And this is why so many women on low-fat diets end up with these tremendous infertility problems. I can speak to this myself. I basically didn't menstruate for 20 years being a vegan. And everybody in my vegan world said that was normal, that it was a good thing. It's insane. You know, you're such a <laughs> cycle, right? And for me, I stopped being a vegan, particularly the soy. The soy is absolutely fingered in this. I, you know, when I took the soy out of my diet and I started eating broth every day, I went absolutely cold turkey, you know, like in two weeks I did all that. And I have not missed a menstrual period since. It happened right away. It was instantaneous. And boom, I'm like clockwork now. It was unbelievable after 20 years. I mean, I had to just sit there with my mouth open, like, what have I done to myself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my sister ended up with endometriosis. She was also a vegan for a good long time, 14 years. And that was the soy as well. There's a lot of bad things we can say about soy. What I will say right now is if you are eating soy or you think soy is a good thing, I'm going to beg you to do some more research on this on your own because soy is a very, very dangerous substance. In fact, there are some researchers who have said these substances are drugs, not food. So I really hope people will take that to heart and, and do more research before they continue to eat them, particularly if they have children. This is really crucial. These are endocrine dis disruptors, and they can do permanent damage to children. So please rethink soy if you're eating soy. But anyway, go ahead. Well, no, Lier, I think this is the, the message, or at least the thing that's really crystallizing in my head, and, and I really appreciate you, you sharing this information. You are, you are good at speaking. <laughs> There's no question. The, 
the the takeaway, and I'm actually curious of your thoughts here. So if if um here's here's what's frustrating to have happen in life. And I think this happened a lot with the just starve yourself and use stair steppers and, and just eat as few calories as possible from any source as long as you just eat a few calories. The reason that is so detrimental is that you have a group of people who will do that. Like they will try it. They will put their heart and soul into it. They will be hungry, depressed, time deprived. They're not spending time with their families because they're off at the gym. They also stop menstruating because if you're eating 1100 calories per day, I don't care about the source. Your body thinks you're starving and, and, and it doesn't generate the results they want. Like they actually end up harming their health and, and ending up storing more body fat than they ever would have. And when we, when it's, it's one thing, like if, if you do something and it, here's the best case scenario is you do something, it makes you feel better and it makes the world better. Okay. That's best case scenario. There's another scenario where you do something and it makes you feel like crap, but it makes the world a better place. And some people may, may be okay with that. Then there's another scenario where it makes you feel like crap and it doesn't help anyone else. Right. That scenario is just not helpful for anyone. So it, hypothetically, for the listeners who are vegetarians or vegans, if it is making you feel great, that's, that's you, you know, your own, your own prerogative. But if, if this type of lifestyle is making you feel terrible and you're like, but you know what, I'm going to keep it up because my happiness doesn't matter. My health doesn't matter. What matters is the sustainability of the planet. What I think Lier's message is, which is so profound is you might be suffering needlessly. Yeah, I, honestly, it's scenario number three, you're going to hurt yourself and you're not actually doing any good for the planet. And I know that's really heartbreaking. It took me about a year and a half to get over that because it was so important to me to believe in this. And none of it turned out to be true. And I think that's that's the key thing, Leah, where is is if you're doing this, like if for some reason you do it because you enjoy it, like you just like you don't like animal foods. It's just they don't appeal to you. That That's a different thing. But if you are doing it for the these motivations you've described and you're suffering, I think what we're saying here and what Leah is saying is just there, there may be a better way, not only for you to be happy and thrive as an individual, but for you to eat in a way that also helps others to be happy and thrive as individuals. And Leah, I want to spend the, the, the rest of our time together talking about your opinion on if you do have these goals and you don't want to suffer personally and, and you don't want other people to suffer, how should you be focusing your eating efforts the most important thing you can do is find a local farm, as local as you can find. You know, most people live in cities now, but the closest farm you can find that is grass-based. So their land is covered in what's called a perennial polyculture all the time. And usually that means grass. Cows and other animals are meant to eat grass. They are not meant to eat grain. So by keeping the land in that perennial polyculture in that grass, you're doing an amazing number of things to help the world. You are providing habitat for all kinds of wild animals. So there'll be small birds, reptiles, mammals, all kinds of little creatures that can live there and whose homes will never be destroyed. So they can come back year after year and you know, raise their young in that pasture, in that grassland. Um, it means that the roots of those plants are really, really, they're really long and strong. Uh, that's what perennials do. They make these incredible root systems annual plants like wheat and corn and soy, whatever, they cannot make a deep root system. They're not alive long enough. Their whole goal is to produce a seed and then get out of it because they've only got two or three seasons to live. They're called annuals because they only live for less than a year. And their entire goal is to make that great big seed head. Um, but that means that they don't produce a lot of, you know, they don't, they're not trees, right? They, they don't have time to make wood. All they have is a little cellulose and a stem, this great big seed, and then very shallow roots because that's all they've got time for. But it, by having those shallow roots, what it means is that every time it rains, the, the rain cannot penetrate down into, you know, the deeper layers of the soil because there's no channel for it. Whereas where you have the perennials, where you have that grassland, that, that prairie, the, the roots are so deep that it, you know, it can bring the water right down to, the, to help refill the water table each and every time it rains. So there's no runoff. Um, also, by having that really deep root system, I mean, something that's so crucial to life on Earth. The, the perennial plants are the only ones that make minerals available to the rest of us. They do an incredible thing. Those deep root systems 
dig down into the rock, the substratum of our planet, and they break up that rock and they draw up those minerals bit by bit and then make it available to everybody else. So without their action, we're all dead. I mean, there's this great quote, we owe our entire existence to six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains, which is quite true. And one of the things in that topsoil is, of course, these perennial plants. And that's what they do. They, they build soil by their action. They make the rain. They make the moisture go down. They bring it down to recharge the water table. And then, you know, as the, the soil dries out, they bring the water back up and make it available to the rest of the community. And then also this action of the mineral, keeping the mineral cycle going. I mean, without it, we'd all be dead. There's just no way. You know, the, we can't eat rock, but plants do. And they make it available. So if you find a grass-based farm, that's what you're finding is, you know, an entire however many acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, 100 acres that's been restored to that perennial polyculture, all of those other functions can happen. You've got water recharge, you've got building soil, protecting soil, you've got the mineral cycle, healthy and good, you've got all these other plants and animals that can live there, whatever running bodies of water are nearby um, are going to be safe and protected as well, because that's what perennials do. So the world has been restored in a really primary way. And one of the most important things, and this in, in many ways is, I think, the, the, the biggest thing, the, the most important reason to, to switch to grass-based farming, is that if we even took 75% of the world's grasslands, which have been trashed by agriculture, okay, I mean, they've been just absolutely devastated. But if we could restore even 75% of that landmass to grasslands, to those perennial polycultures, we could actually sequester all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age in about 15 years. That's mm. what it would take. That's it. That's all it would take. Um, it's like, it's been this process of destroy, destroy, destroy. And all we need to do is reverse it and repair, repair, repair. The planet still has hope. You know, if we just got out of the way, <laughs> if we let the planet be what it wants to be, a grassland or a forest, it's not too late. You know, th this could be done. We don't need these bizarre high-tech solutions. The, the planet knows how to do this. This is the basic job of grass is to create topsoil and it can be done. So find one of those farms where they're doing grass-based farming. And what you will find is a ruminant. So it's probably either going to be a cow or a bison. And, you know, you could come back 10,000 years later and you would find the exact same thing. You would find grass, you would find bison, you'd find all these other creatures that are part of the cycle. And the only difference is you'd find more topsoil because it would have built another few feet of topsoil in that time. Um, so it's a perfect cycle. It's a closed loop. And this is what we participated in for our first 4 million years on this planet. It's really only in the last 10,000 years that we've become destructive. And it was by taking up that activity called agriculture. So when you do grass-based farming, that's really pastoralism. Okay. People get confused when I talk about agriculture. Like that's not just any way that people get food. It's a very specific activity. It involves clearing the land, planting those annual monocrops, and, um, you know, that slow drawdown process. Whereas these other ways that people have gotten food, which would include things like hunting and gathering, it would include pastoralism, um, it would include horticulture, which is, you know, most people's gardens. Um, all of that can be done very sustainably. So the best thing you can do is find one of those grass-based farms near you, get your eggs from them. Those should be chickens running around on those fields as well. They make an incredible adjunct with the ruminants. They help each other in all kinds of ways. These are symbiotic relationships. The, like, for instance, the chickens will scratch the, um, the dung, the, you know, the waste products from the cows and spread it out because they have that scratching that they do. They'll spread out the manure. And then really crucially, they eat the eggs and the insects that are inside that manure. So they keep, naturally will keep the, the cows free of disease and parasites just by doing what chickens do. So chickens, ducks, turkeys, whatever, you, you need some fowl in there to keep the system you know, going. So that's um, another thing you can look for. Pigs also play a really great role in a, a grass-based farm. They have a whole other function where they eat a lot of waste products. Um, so, you know, leftover stuff that nobody else will eat, the pigs will eat and they'll put it to good use. And then, you know, and our role in all of this as well is, you know, we're, we're sort of apex predators. So our job is to keep the population down to sustainable numbers. And that's what predators do, whether it's wolves or bears or humans, that's our role as well. Without the predators, the ruminants will overrun it. And in two or three years, you will have nothing but desert. So it may seem cruel in a moment that, yes, everybody has to die. But if we don't die, then there is no room for the next generation. And that was a very, very hard thing for me to accept. But no matter what I was eating, something had to die. Um, and honestly, that's information I should have had by the time I was four or five years old. But 
we don't live in a culture that recognizes that. And it was very hard won for me to come to that. So anyway, grass-based farm. Find a grass-based farm. <laughs> no, and that's and the, the beautiful thing here, Lier, is we, we started this show off talking about how these the, the the pursuit of of like black and white and we don't have time to really understand all the nuance and information but but what what i hear us arriving at here is is actually beautifully simple in the sense that so if we if we consider each individual person as an island which we know we're not but let's just do a thought experiment the way to propagate the most lasting health and happiness in that individual is to and this is not questionable this has been demonstrated clinically and clinically as well as for thousands of generations on the planet is to eat nutrient dense animals and plant foods it's not about saying like this is good this is bad it's nutrient density is the goal and nutrient density comes from both animals and from plants and interestingly enough you know where we find the most nutrient dense animals and plants well we find them on when they are produced sustainably sustainable agriculture is that which, or maybe not agriculture is the wrong word, but sustainably produced plants and animals are also the most nutrient dense plants and animals. And by, therefore, by pursuing that which is most nutrient dense and that which would benefit us the most as an island, we are actually serving the greater good as effectively as we can. And that's a pretty awesome cycle in and of itself. Yeah. And I have to say, I found a great deal of solace in that you know, as I came out of my vegan worldview, it was really hard. And when I realized exactly what you're saying, it did offer me, you know, some, some sense of healing that, you know, I mean, it was so hard. I mean, I cried for like a year and a half. <laughs> I found this other way and I was like, okay, so the values are all still there and I can still participate in this repair of the planet and eat this really good food. It's just going to be different than I thought. Mm -hmm. So I just said that the underlying values stayed the same, but my framework on top of those values did a tremendous shift. Um, and that's not an easy process. I am not, you know, at all. I, if people have hung on this long with the interview, I really commend that because I don't know when I was a vegan, I don't know that I would have listened this long. I would have been too upset mm -hmm. and I would have stopped listening. So, you know, thank you if you've hung on, because I know this is really big. When, and Leah, I'm an eternal optimist, um, potentially to a fault, but I, the thing that encourages me so much about this is uh, well, I'll just say, like, I don't want to live in a world where, like, the only way the world can survive is if humans are sick and suffering. Like, that doesn't seem to make sense. Like, why? Like, that's not a symbiotic system. Like, humans are supposed to be symbiotic. We're supposed to exist in a world in which we can continue to exist. So it never really resonated with me that the way we have to eat is a way that harms us. Like, the way that heals the planet should also heal the individual and interestingly enough, that is what we've arrived at here. That which is best for the planet is that which is best for the individual. And it's not about saying plants are globally good or bad and animals are globally good or bad. It's about saying the way in which we produce those things is so critical and focusing on quality and sustainability rather than these blanket, this is good, that is bad, is serves everyone, correct? Yeah, that's a be that's beautifully put. That's exactly it. And and we can be part of that cycle again. Well, Lier, I really, really appreciate your time and insights. And everyone, if you want to dig deeper into this, which, which I hope you would, because it is a very important subject. Again, Lier's book is The Vegetarian Myth. And her name, again, is Lier Keith. You can learn more about her as an individual at LierKeith.com. And that is L-I-E-R-R-E-K-E-I-T-H dot com. Lier, thank you so much for sharing your time and insights with us today. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Jonathan. Hey, listeners, I hope you found this show as enjoyable and informative and provocative as I did. And remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Talk with you soon.